Coming to this issue uh, that you've alluded to and written about a great deal, uh, many of the actions that the Chinese Communist Party are taking, though, appear to me to make their own position less viable. I mean, you know, they've got uh, a very rapid demographic decline. You've got empty cities, as I understand it. Um, you've got this real tension between innovation and entrepreneurship and you see these big move back towards socialism and, um, you know, so-called equitable society. You've got sky-high uh, private sector debt uh, and truly amazing uh, public sector debt, as I understand it as well, plus now real international um, pushback. So don't those things in some ways suggest that, uh, and I think I'm you know, putting words in your mouth, but this is what you've been saying, that there's nothing inevitable about China's continuing rise at all. That's right, John. I think one of the problems that bedevils Western analysis of China uh, is that we tend to exaggerate uh, the strength of the system. Just as we used to exaggerate the strength of the Soviet Union, uh, we're always taken in very easily uh, by trips to uh, a few flagship cities. Uh, and just as people would go to the Soviet Union in the 1930s and say, I've seen the future and it works, so over the last 20 years, uh, people from the West have made trips to Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen, and they've, they've said much the same thing. In reality, China is in very serious difficulties. Firstly, for the reason you mentioned, its population is uh, going to shrink. Uh, if you look at the, the worst case scenario of the United Nations population uh, forecasts, it could decline by half between now and the end of the century. It's certainly likely to decline by around 20%. Its workforce is already shrinking. Uh, it is, as has often been said, uh, getting old before it gets rich. On top of that, the business model of the last 20 years has been heavily reliant on uh, not so much bridges to nowhere as apartments for no one, tower blocks that uh, are unlikely ever to be occupied. Uh, and this is a core part and a very large part of Chinese economic activity, as my old friend Ken Rogoff demonstrated in a very impressive paper uh, last year. Uh, only Spain on the eve of the global financial crisis uh, had such a large part of economic activity tied to real estate as China does today. And don't forget the climate problem that the Chinese have, the more the rest of the world agrees that drastic steps have to be taken to reduce uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, the tougher China's position is. Fact, 93% of the increase in coal consumption since Greta Thunberg was born, which was in 2003, is accounted for by China. China is really the bad boy. Uh, in the climate change debate. And that is going to become more and more obvious, uh, which is why Xi Jinping is having to make concessions on constructing coal burning power stations outside China. But of course, the real problem is the ones that they keep building inside China. So the Chinese model uh, was already reaching the limits of what was sustainable. The true, I think, natural growth rate is much closer to two or three percent than, than to six or seven percent. And we're gradually seeing this uh, economic gravity pulling growth down, uh, despite uh, all the efforts of, of the regime uh, to keep the show on the road. So I think that's part of the reason for Xi Jinping's feelings of insecurity. The reason the party worries about its future, and they really worry that they won't even make it to celebrate the centenary of the People's Republic uh, in 2049, is that they know the system say, under the weight of its own contradictions. And let's not forget the inequality, uh, which is, of course, the reason for all the neo-Maoist talk that we hear for season, from Xi Jinping. If your Gini coefficient is up in Latin American territory, if you have inequality that you, you'd really need to go to Latin America to see, then, of course, there's a problem. Uh, and that is, I think, a big part of the explanation for the increasingly Marxist-Leninist tone 
of, of Xi Jinping's speeches. None of this seems to me to portend China's inexorable rise. Rather the opposite. I think China is in much more trouble over a 20 year time horizon than the United States or its allies. The problem, John, is that it is often when uh, regimes like the Chinese regime feel weak and insecure that they take uh, geopolitical risk uh, because the way out of this uh, predicament, uh, at least in the eyes of some Chinese nationalists, is in fact conflict. Because through nationalism, you can re-legitimize the regime, which otherwise is in danger of losing its legitimacy. And that's the worry for me. It's not China's rise that poses the problem. It's China's weakness and the insecurity of its own, if, of its own ruling Communist Party. Uh, I understand you, you've written on that extensively, and I profoundly believe that you are right to warn us that, in fact, the, a, a wounded bear or a bear aware that it doesn't have uh, quite the lifespan or, and, the, and the power that others think it does can be very tempted to strike out. And that leads immediately to, to, their question, to the question of how they perceive the West. Um, and you've written about this as well a lot. Uh, you know, the, the Second World War, Churchill described as the unnecessary war. So many signals were sent, self-loathing, self-doubt, the British upper classes, elites and so forth. Uh, the famous Oxford debate, you know, I wouldn't die for king and country. Uh, Churchill saw those as only encouraging a Germany that was in no powerful position in those earlier days to take on the West to think, well, the West won't fight, so we'll push on. Uh, so how is all of a, this tied? How, what's the, what's the, how do we understand how China sees the, the West and in, in this dangerous state where it may be tempted to have a go out of weakness rather than strength? There's no doubt that the image of the United States uh, in China has uh, been very tarnished, not just by uh, the recent past. It's really been going on since the financial crisis, uh, which was a rude awakening for those Chinese who thought that the US was really the uh, the most impressive uh, show in town. I think even more recently, uh, America's mishandling of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has added to the Chinese sense that the US has passed its sell-by date as a superpower. And then you've got, of course, the cult of wokeism and the uh, the increasingly divided uh, political culture of of the United States, the self hating uh, aspects of uh, of phenomena like critical race theory. The Chinese watch all this and they conclude that the United States uh, is tearing itself apart and therefore highly unlikely to be able uh, to mount an effective defense if there is a Taiwan crisis. And they're not entirely wrong to think this. I, I certainly struggle to see how this administration would persuade the American public that they needed to go to war uh, over Taiwan, an island that very few Americans, I think, could find uh, on a map of the world. So the Chinese sense that the US is, is divided, is weak, it's is past its prime. I don't think this is unjustified. In many ways, it's true. If you look at the numbers, as I did in a recent piece for The Economist a, a few weeks ago, actually the US looks a lot like Britain between the wars, uh, weighed down with debt, uh, with all kinds of uh, domestic preoccupations and a kind of lack of enthusiasm for the role of, of global policemen. I mean, remember, three presidents since George W. Bush have disavowed America's global mission, starting with Barack Obama, followed by Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. Uh, there is a, a kind of variation on a theme here where everybody basically agrees that the war on terror was a huge mistake and the United States should just come on home and focus on its domestic knitting. So when the Chinese look at the United States, they see a country that doesn't look ready for a showdown, uh, certainly not uh, in a faraway country of, of which Americans know relatively little. Uh, so I think part of what's going on here is China's sense of insecurity combines with the perception that the US is not really up for it. And that's encouraging what I think is a rather dangerous uh, tendency in Beijing to consider the possibility of a dramatic move uh, on the international stage to try 
uh, to cement the legitimacy of Xi Jinping's leadership and the Communist Party's leadership. And that, that's why that, that's why it all kind of matters. It, it matters that China is in all kinds of ways structurally in trouble because that incentivizes Xi Jinping to consider taking risk and playing the nationalist card. It also matters that the United States is going through a kind of late Soviet phase. I mean, you can't help thinking there's something late Soviet about the United States today when the president shows every sign uh, of, of, of creeping senility and that the top military uh, have so many ribbons on their uniforms that they seem to have stumbled out of uh, some kind of Soviet documentary from the 1970s. So I, I don't blame the Chinese for thinking that the US has passed its super power sell by date. It's just that people have made this mistake before. The US often looks in its history as if it's uh, in self-destruct mode. It did in the mid 1970s. Remember all those analogies between the fall of Kabul and the fall of, of Saigon in 1975 People forgot to point out that the fall of Saigon did not exactly presage the decline and fall of the United States, because really within a very short period of time, US, uh, the US was bouncing back under Ronald Reagan and winning the Cold War under George H.W. Bush. So it looks like the US is going through one of its periodic meltdowns, but it's done that before and bounced back. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.